and welcome. It's a beautiful day, beautiful day to be in the house of the Lord. Uh, we're going to do some singing, going to do some preaching, and then we're going to do some eating afterwards. So it's going to be a great day. Let's all stand and greet each other as we uh, continue singing just an old-fashioned touch. Just an old fashioned touch, we need so much. Just an old fashioned touch from Jesus. Just an old fashioned song to come and sing along a song. Please, y'all may be seated for a minute. Such a great day. Uh, we'll let Brother Dan get back down here in his usual spot. <laughs> I guess the groundhog got it wrong. It's early spring. I'm loving it. I don't know about y'all. Brother Danny is too. Amen. Well, uh, we're going to continue singing today. If you will, please stand back up again. We're going to start with uh, Blessed, number 795. I am 
am so wondrously saved from sin. Jesus so sweetly abides within. There at the cross where he took me in. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Come to this fountain so rich and sweet. Cast thy poor soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge in today and be made complete. Glory to his name. singing today about the name of Jesus. And let's sing about how wonderful that name is. Number 118. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. wonderful Jesus my Lord he's the great shepherd the rock of all ages almighty God is he bow down be seated. I tell you, uh, the longer I stay here, the more I just sense the holy presence of God as we gather to worship Him. And truly, the ground on which we stand is holy. Can I hear an amen? amen. It is holy ground. And the one who we've come to worship is just like the song worded we just sung. His name is wonderful. And his name is wonderful because he is wonderful. Amen. Amen. It is so good to be in God's house today. And I'm so glad that we can worship him and praise and adore his wonderful and holy name. If you're visiting among, among us today, first of all, I want you to know we don't have visitors here at Webb Baptist Church. You're our honored guest, and we're so grateful and thankful and pleased that you're with us today. We hope you'll just feel the presence of God as all of us wish to feel today and to just reach out and touch the face of Almighty God and make everlasting contact with Him. Uh, I want to say that uh, you, some have asked me, Brother Danny, are we going to receive a separate offering for the I Love My Church offering today? No, because all of it is going to the general fund anyway. So when we pass the plate, that will be your opportunity to place your I Love My Church offering uh, today. It all goes together. Uh, I also have an announcement that I would prefer someone else to make. Hunter, would you, uh, Hunt, and by the way, Hunter has been through it. And he's come through. Hunter, I want you to come and speak at the microphone. And you may have to raise that thing up a little bit. <laughs> uh, it's glad to be back with y'all, church. Uh, but so two weeks from today, uh, March 13th at 4.30, we're going to start to have a general discipleship class. 
Um, two weeks from today, we have a couple going already. We have a young adult. We have Miss Belinda teaching a class kind of aimed toward widows. Um, but we're going to start a general kind of discipleship class. Everyone's welcome. It'll be Sunday nights, at least to start off at 430. Here at the church, we're going to meet down here in the old fellowship hall and, and figure out what class we need to get from there with who shows up. So y'all, uh, come on out. Did I forget anything? No, we're officially starting discipleship training. Yeah, this is like the official start of discipleship training. And um, teachers, I'll be reaching out to y'all weekly to get counts for, for y'all's classes. So. <laughs> okay, thank you, Hunter. Hunter and I have been talking about this and praying about this even before the church elected him as church discipleship training director. I'm excited to get that program up and running. Like, like he said, we already have two wonderful classes that are already going and blowing, and now this will be a third. And again, whatever your age, we'd like for you to come. Uh, it's basically, go basically going to be a, you might say, a, a class for true Christian discipleship. We're going to start with the first book that Hunter's going to teach called the beginning and it'll go for six weeks and then uh, and then I'll step in and teach the second class and it will be called the walk and we'll go with it and then we go all the way through for about I think uh, a half a year and we'll finish the series of books but it's going to be good and we'd love for whatever your age to come and I may say adult whatever your adult age uh, or even older youth, you're certainly invited to come, and uh, any youth, I should say, and come and be a part of that class, and we're looking so forward to it. Folks, God is at work here. Can I hear an amen? And I'm just beginning to see glimpses of little things he's doing that are becoming bigger things he's doing, and I love to pastor a church that's just ready to get on the go with God, and uh, I, I can hardly wait to see what he wants to do next, so... That will be two weeks from this Sunday. We start that next class right here at church, 4.30. Hunter will be the teacher of this one, and I'm looking forward to it. Uh, thank you for coming today. Uh, at this time, we want to, oh, by the way, don't forget, after church today, we're going to the fellowship hall, and we'll be having our I Love My Church uh, fellowship meal and so that's going to be a great time together i've got a couple of other things in mind for march april and may and i'll be saying more to you about it probably this wednesday night and folks god just doing some good things and i'm so grateful for that uh now we come to a time of prayer and we certainly want to lift up our sick that god would be in them with them the most urgent on my list right now is John Ivey. John is in surgery right now as they're, uh, he, he had an appendicitis attack and so I presume they're going to remove uh, the uh, appendix. So pray for John even now as he's probably either in or has just completed his time of surgery. We certainly want to continue to pray for LaVon Barley. I was on the phone with Doris a couple days ago and he's doing great. He just needs to get a little bit better before he can be back in church. But Doris said that time's coming. Don't know exactly when, but he is improving. But the cancer's gone. Can I hear another amen on that? Amen. <laughs> yes, we will praise the Lord with hands together. So uh, we just want to continue to, to celebrate that. Uh, thank the Lord Hunter is over his uh, hoof and mouth disease. No, it's not hoof and mouth disease. Uh, <laughs> There is such a thing, isn't there, Allison? But it, it, that's not what Hunter had. He's not moving or anything like that. Uh, getting over his hand, hand and mouth disease. And, and, uh, and so we're just grateful for that, Hunter. Uh, so let's just come to the Lord together in prayer for all of these. Folks, let's pray for our country. America needs Jesus. Can I hear an amen? America needs revival. And we're seeing some glimpses of revival breaking out on college campuses and a few churches in our country. Folks, I want it to break out right here in our church. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. I don't want to embarrass myself by saying it to you, but it's important. Uh, last night, I just felt the need to come, and I walked the perimeter of our property about three times and prayed for all who will be here. Then I came in a building, and where you're seated, I have passed in prayer for you today, just passed through all the pews and up here on the platform saying, God, you're welcome here. 
And I'm asking God to just make himself mighty among us and touch every heart. I think I'm going to be doing that pretty regularly now. But I want to invite all of you in your way, whatever way God puts it on your heart, to pray more for your church. Because the revival that I think God wants to bring to us, it only comes on the wings of prayer. Amen. The more we pray, the more we will experience his God-sent revival. So I'm looking so forward to that. Let's pray at this time. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the wonderful joy and privilege of coming together in your holy house today. And truly, we are standing on holy ground. And oh God, thank you that it's holy because you make it holy. It's holy because you are here. It's holy because it has been dedicated to worshiping the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the great I Am. And so God, as we recognize that we're on holy ground and we're in a holy place, oh Lord, may our lives be open to you to allow you to speak to our hearts and produce in us the change that you wish to make. Help us all, Lord, all of us, every one of us, Lord, to be more devoted to you and more willing, Lord, to let you do in us, with us, and through us whatever you please to do, whatever the cost. Lord, bless Webb Baptist Church. Thank you, Lord, for the magnificent ministry that you've called this church to do through the past years. Lord, we thank you for what is in your mind to do with us and through us in the coming years. God bless us. Help us, Lord, truly to express not only our love for the church, but our love for the head of the church, Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. So, God, we pray for our service today that you will move mightily among us. And then, Lord, we pray for those whose names were called out for prayer for John as he's probably in the final part of his surgery, if not completed, and now in recovery. Be with John and bless him and give him full recovery from this appendicitis attack. Lord, we pray for Levon. How we thank you and praise you for healing him of this dreadful cancer. Lord, we pray that you'll heal him completely now from the harm it has done him and that he'll be able to be back in church very soon, he and Doris. May they feel the love and the prayers of their church even now as we pray for them. Lord, we pray for Sandra Webb. God bless Sandra and heal her. God be with her. And oh Lord, we pray for all who are sick with so many sicknesses and diseases. Lord, we pray for John Riles that you will heal John completely. Make him well. And oh God, we lift all of those up in our hearts and minds whose names were not called out. You know everyone. We ask, O oh God, that you would release your wonderful, amazing healing power into their body. Heal them completely and bless their loved ones who are so concerned about their condition right now. God, we pray for those in our auditorium who, who are sick with a variety of illnesses. God, help them and bless them. Heal them completely. Lord, how we pray for Kay that you'll prepare her body for the, the kidney transplant when that time comes and and Lord, just let it come right on schedule and be exactly the one she needs and that she will heal completely. You're such a good and gracious and merciful God. God bless us. Bless our church. God bless our country. God help America to get well. And we pray this in the strong, the beautiful, the mighty name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And all God's people said, Amen. Kevin, come on up and, and lead us in the next. Let's see, we got a testimony. We have flown in an evangelist all the way from the other side of Webb. Come on up, Glenn, share your story with us. I got my water and everything. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all have to bear with me. Can you hear me okay? Or do you need to hold this mic? Y'all hear me okay? Okay. Uh, Ann, call, Ann called me a few weeks ago and said, could you take about five minutes and tell the church why you love the church? I said, well, I don't know. My throat's all messed up. And she said, well, I'm going to go ahead and pencil you in. So, <laughs> <thank you. laughs> I love my church. I just jotted down a few thoughts that came to my mind. I said, I love my church because it's faithful and it's to God and to his word. 
I love my church because it's a loving church. And I love my church because it's a welcoming church. The church is resilient. And I am thankful for the church, history of this church and for its future. And I would tell you to bear with me because 20 years ago I could have talked without looking at my notes, but now I got to look at my notes, so <laughs> y'all bear with me. Um, I thought about my relationship with the church. And we didn't come to church at Webb when I was little because we didn't have a car and we lived too far away to walk. And uh, so when I was six, Daddy got a first car and we started coming back to Webb. My mother had been raised here in this church but had, had moved away. So uh, over that time, a lot of people, I couldn't name all of them, that had influence on my life through this church. And uh, I've been affiliated with the church for quite a while. When I was six, that was uh, 72 years ago. So I've been here, I've been affiliated with the church for quite a while. And uh, <coughs> I thought about some of the people that had, had influenced me a little bit, a lot, and I couldn't name all of them, but I want to name just two or three. Um, my first Sunday school teacher was Miss Ruby Newton. Some of y'all remember her, but not many of you, probably maybe none of you, but uh, she, she was our Sunday school teacher, and she gave me and Gladys a set of dogs, a big dog and a puppies. And mine was brown and white, and Gladys was black and white. And I thought I had them, but I can't find them, so I guess I've lost them. But I, I wanted to say that that memory has stuck me, that little gift, for all these years. Uh, there was uh, Mr. Cecil Webb, was my Sunday school teacher. We met back here in the back of the church, and uh, he's the first teacher that came to my house to visit me and invite me back to Sunday school. So, and, I, and he was a great man, died young, very young. Joe Woodham was a lifelong influence on me. He taught my son in school as a 12 and 14 year old, and uh, then we were great friends through all of his lifetime. Uh, back in my early days, we would have church revivals, and all the churches around would join in and come. And uh, there was a lot of kids about my age, a few years each side, and, that revival, I was nine, a lot of kids were joining the church, coming down. So Gladys and I told my daddy, we were ready to join the church. And we wanted to accept Christ, and uh, we did. And the preacher, t the preacher met with us. We answered all his questions just right. But you know what, we weren't saved. We were baptized, we still weren't saved. And when I was 12 years old, right where Amanda's sitting, in Bible school is where I met the Lord. And uh, it's, been a, it's been a great time. And uh, uh, so I was saved at 12 years old. I was rebaptized at 42 when I came under, when I realized I had never been baptized as a believer. So I was baptized again. Um, some of the memorable things I'd like to mention as a part of my love for the church and its history is that. The church was a giving church. They, we needed a pastorum. And somebody in the church donated all the lumber on his farm. And we sawed it down. We built a house that's still there today. Where they did it. Where they enjoy. Um, I remember this church used to sit over there about 100 feet that way. And when you go out this door, you either had to go upstairs or downstairs. Upstairs went to a few Sunday school classes and downstairs went to the basement. That was where my Sunday school class was when I was six. Okay. <coughs> Let's see. I remember another occasion. We heard from Miss Christine Long last week, and her brother, Burley Hasty, was Sunday school superintendent. And he said, if we have 125 in Sunday school, y'all can bust a watermelon over my head. <laughs> and you know what? We busted a woman over his head. <laughs> now, he, he put a board up there, but he still got the, he still got the treatment. Yeah. Uh, 
After I left the church, after I went into the Air Force, there was a family moved here from Mount Air and brought their membership here. And that was the Lord East family that included my bride. You know, so when I came back home, we were able to meet her because she was here in Whip in church. Um, now remember also that Easter eggs had were real eggs. You could crack and eat them. Yeah. So, <coughs> the church is resilient, as I said. Uh, one time, lightning struck the steeple and set the church on fire. And a race in Elgrove drove by and saw it and would save the church. Without that, it would have probably burned down. Uh, we had a pastor who had been here about eight years. And uh, one night he came up to preach and he started praying. And he prayed so hard. And he said, Lord, if it takes it, take me across the street if it takes it. Bible school was the next week. He drove the bus Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and went to the hospital and was dead before Sunday, the next Sunday. The church survived. The church came through. Uh, about 40 years ago, the uh, church, about half the church walked out. The church overcame that. About 25 years ago, another half walked out. The church overcame. The church came back. The Lord bless. We've had some great pastors. We've had some great interim pastors. In fact, one of them we called in to be the preacher after he'd been interim for a while. So, uh, God's always blessed the church to come out of these challenges. The last one we had was COVID. And we're coming out of that now. Um, you, won't, you won't think this story is going where it needs to go. Let me take a water, drink of water. This is what preachers do when they say, excuse me. <laughs> About, the Bible records the Mount of Transfiguration. Mount Hermon is what some people think it was. And I saw Mount Hermon with my own eyes in Lebanon and Syria. But, uh, uh, remember that Jesus took Peter, James, and John up with him on the Mount of Hermon. And they went to sleep. And while they were asleep, Jesus was changed into a glorious being. And who was there with him? Moses and Elijah. The deacons woke up. They got distracted. They woke up and uh, they got distracted again. Peter said, oh, I'm going to be with three tabernacles here. And uh, all of a sudden, there was nobody there but Jesus. And uh, I'm going to say again that you don't know where this is going, but let me, let me, go, let me, let me go on a little bit further. Uh, I got to use my laptop now. I think I left off it. Hold on a minute. Just a minute. You should give me time to catch my breath, too. I once saw a prayer for Sunday. Let me read it to you. Oh Lord, I ask you to give me a keen awareness of your presence at church today. Please examine my heart and reveal to me any behavior or attitude in me that is not pleasing to you. And then please help me completely repent of those things and sincerely allow you to have control of my thoughts, my attitudes, my desires, my words, and my behavior. 
help me this day to remember my life, to surrender my life to you. Um, it's easy to get distracted, but at Web, we have a daily quickening, spiritual quickening, each twice a day. Then we get a text from Brother Danny with thanks for us. So with, with my church, with my love for the church, I'd like to say that we love Brother Dan, Danny and, Bro, and Sister Jan. Thank you. My dad, guess y'all didn't know that. Ain't he good looking? <laughs> and if you hadn't noticed, uh, we're also without Brother Tim and Miss Wanda today. Uh, they have traveled to Memphis to hang out with Elvis. I'm just kidding. They, their, their grandson actually plays baseball for the University of Memphis, and he started a game yesterday for them, so they went to support him in that. And uh, we just want to definitely, if you haven't, say a prayer for them for safe travels for, uh, for their ride home today. So. Let's stand and continue singing today. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, blessed be the name of the Lord, the glories of my God and King. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Jesus, the name that charms our fears, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I never shall forget that day. Blessed be the name of the Lord, when Jesus washed my sins away. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You will please remain standing for our offertory hymn, number 87, Fairest Lord Jesus. Fairest Lord Jesus, ruler of all nature. Shine. 
minds purer than all the angels heaven can boast. Beautiful Savior, Lord of all the nations, Son of Please lead us in our prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time we can gather together. And Father, we just thank you for the testimony. We pray that our music and our worship of you be worthy of your name. Father, we just ask you to take these offerings for your glory and your kingdom alone. Be with Brother Danny as he comes and brings the message that he speaks with Brother Cross. So we may draw closer to you. Be with us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, a few, well, not a few, maybe last week, Miss Heloise mentioned to me that um, there was a song that 
has always ministered to her, and it's going home. Um, I think of Mr. Joe, her husband, uh, as he went home to be with the Lord, and I know that that this song must must mean a lot to her in that respect, but also I think for her because it ministers to me uh, the older I get the more I think about going home and uh, I imagine in her heart uh, because she has a personal relationship with the Lord and uh, if you know Jesus as your Savior I imagine uh, going home is something that is near and more dearer to your heart the older you you get in your life. Uh, so this morning I wanted to share going home. Many times in my childhood As I traveled so far By nightfall how weary I'd roam Father's arms would slip Round me so gently, he'd say, My child, we're going home. Go. nothing to hold me here. I've caught a glimpse of that heavenly land. Praise God, I'm going home now the twilight is fading the day soon shall end I get homesick the farther I roam but my father has led me each step of the way and now I'm going home Go Nothing to hold me here. I've caught a glimpse of that heavenly land. Praise God, I'm going.
Didn't that bless your heart? Say amen. Amen. Thank you, Pam, for letting God use you to touch our hearts like that. I tell you, I, I don't uh, think that anyone would disagree with me when I say with all the evil that we have to uh, be bombarded with in our culture these days, uh, so much going on. I think it causes all of us to think just a bit more about heaven and where things are, are beautiful and perfect and, and we'll be in the presence of Almighty God. And uh, going home truly does, I think, enter our minds a lot more. But God has given us the privilege to stay here, at least for a while some longer than others. I do hope that uh, I will be here in this pulpit next Sunday and, uh, and, and many more because uh, I just feel that God has work for us to do uh, even in a culture that's just gotten so evil. Look at the opportunity that the church has to shine that light brighter than ever before. I thank the Lord for uh, putting it on our hearts to emphasize our church and our love for the church this month. And I might go ahead and say, and I've discussed this with some of you, I would like to extend the theme a little while longer because there are some other things that I need to say to you uh, about loving our church. In fact, uh, next Sunday I plan to preach a sermon titled, Because I Love My Church, I will pray for my church. And I want to emphasize the incredible power that God's people have when we pray. Can I hear an amen? When we pray, we're making contact with Almighty God. And God works best when His people pray. Certainly, and I've said this already more times than not, and that is that when revival comes, it always comes on the wings of prayer. You don't just make revival happen. You don't conjure it up. You don't will it to happen. You don't plan for it to happen. You pray. And when we pray, God brings the revival, not just in the church. I think it starts in the church. I think it always starts in the church or in an organization that is part of the church, for instance, a Christian university but he can spread it from there to wherever he wants to. I understand that Texas A&M is starting to have revival break out, and that's a secular school. But God is, is pulling together believers who are on that campus and revival's breaking out. Folks, I don't really know what's really going on other than God is saying to America, I'm going to give you another chance. It's been a long time since we've had a great awakening The last one was before the Civil War. It is high time we have another great awakening in the United States of America. So the church will be a key part, and it always has been and always will be, of revival in America. Turn with me, if you will, in your scripture today. We're going to revisit Malachi chapter 3. And again, we will begin with verse 8 of Malachi chapter 3. Malachi 3 verse 8 says, it asks the question, Will a man rob God? You have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. And then through the prophet Malachi, God provides the remedy for the curse. He says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, and see if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blood that there will not be enough room for you to receive it. One of the truths about this passage that I'd like to add to what I said last week is that these blessings do not always take the form of financial blessings. They can come purely and simply in the powerful moving of the Holy Spirit of God among His people. Yes, the financial blessings come. 
But thank God beyond that are the spiritual blessings which are more eternal and more meaningful to all of us. We've already noticed last Sunday in the first message I preached on this topic that when I tithe or when I get under the windows, I acknowledge my relationship with God. We also notice that when we tithe, when we get under the windows, we demonstrate our obedience to God. And then lastly, I ran forward and I finished with the last point, and I'm not going to go back and preach that point again. When I tithe, when I get under the windows, I strengthen the ministry of God. My church. Now you say, Brother Danny, I, I, I want to make sure I understand what you mean when you say, when I get under the windows. I get that from God's promise to God's people when we tithe. He said, put me to the test. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse. Try me now in this and see if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out on you a blessing that's greater than you have the capacity to receive. And what we do when we tithe is we position ourselves under the windows of heaven. Let's look at the next thing that we do when we get under the windows. And if you're looking in your outline in your bulletin, you notice that when we tithe, when we get under the windows, we reveal our priorities. We reveal our priorities. In Matthew chapter 6 verse 33, Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God. Let me repeat that. He said, seek first the kingdom of God. He didn't say seek last, seek second, seek third. He said, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and then He promises, and all these other things shall be added to you. Now what are those other things? Well, in that same segment of Scripture, He talked about all the things that the Gentiles preoccupy themselves with. Clothing, a place to stay, food to eat, all the the basics of life they spend their lives worrying about and seeking to make sure that they have not only enough but more than enough. And Jesus said, we don't have to worry. Now that don't mean we all have to quit our jobs and and just depend on God to just pour out all the blessings we need. If He gave you health, and He gave you intelligence, and He gave you some learning and some training and some understanding, apply what He's given you in the context of a vocation somewhere on this earth and make a living doing things that will honor God and provide for your family. Paul the Apostle himself was an evangelist. He was a missionary, but someone tell me, what else was he? A tent maker. And so he had a secular vocation to provide an income as he served the Lord wherever God sent him to serve. And God will have us do no less. So use your talent, use your training, use your knowledge, use your ability, and apply it within a vocation where you can be useful to God and also a blessing to the church. I remember Hunter. I hope I don't embarrass you with this. I'm going to do my best to to do that, but we'll see. Hunter got a promotion. And the first thing that Lauren said when he shared with her the sizable increase in income is she said, we'll have more for the church. I said, amen, brother. That's what I love hearing from my church members. And so she put it in the context of of a raise in pay means more that you can give to the church. Folks, let me tell you something. God gives us abilities to make an income, to draw in an income, and He also requires that we give part of that income back to His church. So when I tithe and when I position myself under the windows, I reveal my priorities. I am seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and I'm letting God, maybe I should say I'm trusting God to take care of, of all the rest. And so when I make a practice of setting aside that first tenth of my income to the Lord, I am establishing a pattern. 
I am making a visible statement about the priorities in my life. I am answering the question. What is the question? The question is what is most important in my life. And when I give my first tent back to the Lord, I'm answering the question. And the answer is God is. Malachi 3.10 says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Someone once said, you say you love Jesus, that's good. Then prove it. James himself said, you believe in God, that's good. Show it. Show evidence of it. So when I tithe, when I place myself under the windows, then I am revealing my priorities. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, Jesus Himself said, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where the moth and the rust can corrupt, where the thieves can break in and steal. He said, Instead, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Jesus Himself is pointing out the dichotomy there. He's pointing out the contrast. Instead of laying up for myself treasures on earth, lay up for myself treasures in heaven, he said in verse 20, where neither the moth nor the rust can come and corrupt, or where the thieves cannot break in and steal. And then in verse 21, what a tremendous troubling statement he said. For where your treasure is, there's your heart. You want to find where a man's treasure is, follow where he spends his money. We all, especially those of us who are grandparents, we find ourselves spending money on our grandchildren. Why? Because we treasure them. They are precious and dear to us. And no one should be faulted for doing that. A man or a woman who works tries to provide for their family and take care of their family. Why? Because you love your family and you want to make sure that they are cared for. But there are some folks who go far beyond that and they just pile and pile and pile on themselves a lot of things of this world and they give very little attention to eternal things. I think that's what Jesus is pointing out here. It's right for a man or woman to provide for their family. But then there is a spirit that can enter into a person and cause that person to begin to focus everything on themselves and then everything becomes about yourself. And your priorities in life focus on yourself. But when we tithe, when we get under those windows, we're showing that our treasure is with God and with things of eternal value. Where your treasure is, There is your heart. Where do you place your treasure? I hope that all of us will more and more place more of our treasure in the kingdom of God. I had the personal privilege to know Truett Cathy. Truett Cathy is probably the most wealthy person I've ever met in my life. And uh, there's a story behind all of that. You don't have time to hear it today, but I would like to share it one day. And that is we became friends. And I knew Truett before he was giving 90% of his income to the Lord. I knew him when he was giving about 50% of his income to the Lord. But he told me in one of those conversations I had with him, his goal was to give 90% of his income to the Lord and only live on 10%. He reached that goal. And millions and millions of dollars left his bank account and went to things that had eternal value. He decided that he did not need to continue to pile and pile and pile upon himself and those he loved, things of this world. So he gave nine-tenths of it away. And the point that he made with me and with Jan when he shared this story with us was that it is his desire to live in God's kingdom while living on earth. And that his priorities would be God priorities. And I don't know if you know much more about that, but he started a, an organization called Windshape. And Windshape was his way of, of his outlet of providing for 
children who were in great need and many things. And he became one of the greatest examples of a Christian just keeping the tenth and giving the 90% away. And I'm, su- I'm not suggesting that you do that, but I'm telling you, in his life, he demonstrated with his behavior that his kingdom was the kingdom of God. And although he had to live on this earth, he wanted to make sure that God was first priority in him. And when we tithe, when we get under the windows, we're showing what our priorities are. And then the next thing we do when we tithe, when we get under the windows, is we exercise faith in God. And I love this point. And I will finish with this point. Verse 10 of Malachi 3. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse and prove me now. In other words, put me to the test. I think God is saying, I dare you. Go ahead, just see what I can do. You bring the tent and watch what I can do. You know, they say the famous last three words of a redneck are, do y'all know what they are? The famous last three words of a redneck? Who said that? That is it. Let's give that boy a hand. All right. And that is a redneck saying that too. (laughs) The last three words of a redneck are, y'all watch this. Well, let me tell you something. God says to us when He says, put me to the test, He says, y'all watch this. I don't think God had the dialect or the tone of a redneck, but it'd be kind of nice to think maybe He did. But He said, y'all watch this. So He said, put me to the test. See if I will not open for you. There are the windows and pour out on you a blessing that is so great there will not be enough room, enough capacity that you have to receive not only the material blessings, but even more so the spiritual, eternal blessing. Put me to the test, he says. I think God says that to believers about a lot of things, not just the giving of our money. He tells us about the giving of our time. Commit yourself to me. Put me to the test and see what I'll do with that time that you give me. He says it about our talent. Put me to the test and see if I'll not open the windows of heaven and pour out on you a blessing that you don't have the capacity to hold it all. Put me to the test. I think God is saying that to Webb Baptist Church right now. Not just in our giving of our finances, but in the giving of our time, in the giving of our talent. In the giving of our passions, put me to the test, he says, and see what I will do when you dedicate yourself, your time, your talent, your energy, your passion, and your material things, and just watch and see what I can do with that. And God will always follow through with His promise. Always. And He will give us that blessing some of it financial, most of it eternal, most of it spiritual, and He will pour it out. And you'll say, how in the world did that happen? Well, God just saying, well, because I did it. Put Him to the test. You see, when we seek first God, we're expressing our faith in God and our confidence that He will do better with us when we give Him first place than we could ever do with ourselves when we withhold the control of our lives and we try to control our lives ourselves. When we tithe, what we're saying when we tithe in this matter of faith is this. We're saying, I believe, God, that you are better able to manage 100% of what I have than I am able to manage 90% of it. When I tithe, I can trust you to do a better job with it, with all of it, than I can with most of it. And so when we tithe, we are exercising our faith in God. Now, as we come to a close of this message today and this series, I want to say to you that tithing is in part about the church. Your church needs what you give. The church functions on the generosity and the tithing of its membership and friends. But 
Tithing is far more about something else than what the church needs. Tithing is about what you need and what I need. I need to deepen my fellowship with God as I put my trust in Him and give my tithe. I need to reveal to those around my priorities for the kingdom of God. I need to draw closer to the Lord in my fellowship with Him. And I certainly don't need to be robbing from God what is already marked by He Himself is His. Folks, God is up to something good here at Webb Baptist Church. Give as the Lord leads you to give. But most importantly, let's be sure that the number one thing we do is not so much material, although that's important, but we draw close to Him and let God begin to develop in us that which He chooses to develop in each and every one of us. And watch what He can do through a life that is wholly devoted to Him. He says, put me to the test. Y'all watch this and see what God can do when we give all to Him. I would encourage you as I close this message today, whatever your pattern of giving to the Lord is, uh, thank you for the, the generosity that you display. But I would ask you to consider between yourself and God in prayer, Lord, What more do you want me to do with my money, with my time, with my talent, with my blessings, with all that I am? God, what do you want to do with me? And God is saying, that's what I've been waiting to hear. Now listen up. And he begins to tell us. I'm going to ask for Kevin to come and lead us in a hymn of invitation. And as he does, whatever it is that God tells you to do, would you do it right now? There may be someone who's uh, dealing with the matter of church membership and you may feel that the Lord is leading you to, to come and unite yourself with this body of believers known as Web Baptist Church. I invite you to do that and be obedient to Him. There may be someone here today who has never received Jesus as your Savior. And today God is knocking at your heart's door saying, let me come in. Will you let Him in? Will you surrender to Him? Will you do what He would wish you to do? As we sing, let's stand together. And would you make that decision as we wait and as we sing? Kevin.